Dr. Courtney is a physician scientist and a medical oncologist here at the Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center. He specializes in hematology oncology, prostate cancer, and testicular cancer. So as usual, don't forget to like and share this conversation. We want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to see it. And also, please remember that, you know, we, due to patient privacy laws, we can't answer very specific medical questions. We would have to answer it in general circumstances, but we'll certainly take as many questions as we can get to. So please submit your comments and questions in the comments stream, and we will start right about now. So Dr. Courtney, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, so I think a lot of people, there's lots of different terms out there, but can you just kind of define prostate cancer? What does it mean to get that diagnosis? Certainly, so prostate cancer is a cancer that arises from the prostate, which is a male reproductive organ, mm -hmm. uh, sits at the base of the bladder, mm -hmm. and certain cells in the, in the prostate start to misbehave mm -hmm. and become cancerous. Okay, all right, so what are some symptoms that people should look for? So most men, more than 80%, who are diagnosed with prostate cancer have localized prostate cancer, okay. uh, which means it's confined to the prostate. And because of the location of the prostate, that can cause urinary symptoms. Okay. Uh, it may be an increase in urinary frequency or the number of times you need to get up in the middle of the night to mm -hmm. urinate or difficulty starting your urine stream or weakening of the urine stream and in some cases, erectile dysfunction. Okay, so with that, you know, there are a number of symptoms there. At what point should someone seek medical attention? So there are a couple of issues with this. Okay. In many cases, men will be undergoing screening for prostate cancer through mm -hmm. their primary care physician, and they may have concerning findings through an elevation in a blood test called the mm -hmm. prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, mm -hmm. or an abnormal feeling prostate on physical examination. Mm -hmm. And that would prompt the primary care physician to refer those patients to a urologist for further evaluation okay. and work up for the possibility of prostate cancer. Men who present with these unexpected changes in urinary mm -hmm. tract symptoms should discuss it with their primary care doctor uh, so that they can undergo an appropriate evaluation okay. to determine if prostate cancer may be one of the possible causes. Okay, good, good to know. I know we've got some questions coming in. I wanted to get those introductory ones out. But here, our first question, here's one from, from Kevin, and that is, why do some types of prostate cancer need to be treated and others can be watched? So it's a very good question. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in mm -hmm. men in the United States, and more than 80% of prostate cancers will be localized, and so right. they'll be confined to the prostate. During the workup and evaluation of prostate cancer, one of the things we determine is how aggressive does the cancer appear. Okay. The vast majority of prostate cancers are a specific histology called mm -hmm. prostatic adenocarcinoma. And the aggressiveness of prostatic adenocarcinoma can be graded with a number score. We call it the Gleason score, mm -hmm. uh, after Dr. Gleason, who was a pathologist, who developed a uniform method of grading these aggressive features. When you combine that with the level of the PSA, mm -hmm. findings on digital rectal exam, and if appropriate, any imaging to see if the prostate cancer has spread past the prostate, mm -hmm. that determines based on the aggressiveness, whether it's safe okay. to monitor the prostate through active surveillance, which is to watch it and periodically check a PSA and do a digital rectal exam and repeat a biopsy periodically, mm -hmm. or whether it is behaving more aggressively and warrants more urgent treatment. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for the question, Kevin. That's a great way to get us started. You know, um, we've got some other issues coming around. There are lots of questions about screening and how appropriate it is, when you should do it, kind of how often should someone be screened? So it's a, an open-ended question. There are a number of different specialty societies who have looked at this and re researched this, and it's hard to come up with a definitive answer. Okay. Uh, and it has changed over time. So the United States Preventative Services Task Force mm -hmm. currently has guidelines for the general population regarding screening. And its recommendation is that for men in the general population between ages 55 and 69, okay. that they should have an informed discussion with their health care provider okay. about the risks and benefits of undergoing 
prostate cancer screening with a blood test, which is the PSA test that we talked about, okay. and possibly a digital rectal examination. And the frequency of that has not been definitively determined. In some general cases, once a year seems to be a reasonable approach if you're going to undergo screening and you're mm -hmm. in that age. That also doesn't account particularly for certain risk factors like mm -hmm. a strong family history or uh, being of African American ancestry, both of okay. which can be associated with a greater risk for prostate cancer. Uh, the guidelines are sort of general and uniform across all populations in the United States, mm -hmm. but it's important to have a discussion with your health care provider okay. given your particular history and circumstances. Okay. So I've heard that there is some controversy around that. I mean, what does the controversy have to do with? Is it just that it's not specific? So that's part of the controversy. The other controversy is that uh, there is risk mm -hmm. to screening procedures for prostate cancer. Okay. So say you see your primary care physician and your PSA is elevated mm -hmm. and they recommend doing prostate cancer screening. They refer you to a urologist who performs biopsies on the prostate. Okay. And undergoing that procedure can have some risks. There's mm -hmm. some risk with biopsies. Uh, infection risk or pain. There's okay. risk of anxiety of wondering okay. what's going to happen. And then in certain cases, if you have a low-grade prostate cancer, you don't necessarily need to treat it. And so you'd be better off in many cases if you're of a certain age and mm -hmm. a certain health status and fitness, okay. maybe not knowing if you had a very low risk localized prostate cancer that's never going to impact you. Okay. And so all of those factors were considered by the various societies okay. and the task force in making their recommendations. Gotcha. In 2012, I think some of the controversy was over the fact that the US Preventive Task Force, Services Task Force mm -hmm. recommended no particular guidelines for prostate cancer screening because they didn't have definitive evidence that the screening was leading to improvement in patient survival or outcomes. Okay. Uh, they've gone back and modified those recommendations based on more inter interpretation of the data mm -hmm. to say, and this aligns with other societies such as the, you know, as ASCO, the American Society mm -hmm. of Clinical Oncologists, or the American Urologic Association, of having an informed discussion with your provider about okay. doing prostate cancer screening. Okay, good questions. Thanks for, for all these questions. Keep them coming now. You mentioned in that, in your explanation there, that there are some known risks of prostate cancer. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so the, the three principal risks mm -hmm. are age, uh, ancestry or race, okay. uh, and family history. So with respect to age, the older you get, the greater the risk of developing prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. The incidence in the Western world is about one in eight or one in seven in your lifetime. Uh, and it's more common the older you get. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to ancestry or race, men of African American ancestry have a higher incidence of prostate cancer. Uh, and may develop it at, in general at an earlier age okay. than men of uh, European ancestry or Asian ancestry. And with respect to family history, we do recommend consideration and discussion of screening okay. with your healthcare provider. If you have a family history, particularly a first degree relative, a father, a brother, or a son okay. with prostate cancer, or multiple family members, or a family member who had prostate cancer diagnosed at a young age. Okay. Okay, so there's some good good questions there. We do have a question in from Alec, and he um, he specifically mentions the urology team. He said, "I see that UT Southwestern's urology team is ranked among the best in the U.S. What differentiates UTSW's program for other hospitals? Maybe you could speak more holistically about you know the prostate cancer team and what differentiates us." Sure, uh, you know we're you know one of the advantages we have is outstanding physicians with outstanding mm -hmm. training who s specialize in these areas. The more you do something, uh, the the more. Uh, knowledgeable you are mm -hmm. and the more adept you are at doing that particular Absolutely. thing and so we have a number of outstanding urologists mm -hmm. who are experts in the management of prostate cancer that also applies to those of us who are in medical oncology and our mm -hmm. radiation oncologists as well and we approach treatment of prostate cancer uh, with a multidisciplinary approach and so we take all of the factors in terms of the risk of the prostate cancer to bring on board the appropriate specialists that you okay. may need. 
Okay, great question, Alec. We're so glad you could join us today. Uh, here's a question from Christy, and it's, what are some common treatments for prostate cancer? So that's a very good question. It's a very broad answer. <laughs> yeah. We could spend two hours talking about that. I'll bin it down into a couple buckets. Sort of bu buckets. Okay. One is the localized cancer bucket, mm -hmm. and one is metastatic cancer. Okay. And the localized cancer bucket depends in part on how aggressive is the cancer, based on features that we already discussed. Um, you know, the Gleason score mm -hmm. and the PSA level, and whether there's a invasion past the prostate into regional tissues or local mm -hmm. regional tissues. And as a result, the treatment and management of localized prostate cancer can run the gamut from just sort of doing watchful waiting, which is mm -hmm. waiting to see if symptoms develop if you're very elderly and are incidentally diagnosed with prostate cancer or okay. if you have other significant medical problems that precede the prostate okay. cancer. Uh, it may involve surgery, which is called a radical prostatectomy, to remove mm -hmm. the prostate and perhaps some regional lymph nodes where mm -hmm. are sites that the cancer can spread initially. Okay. It may involve radiation to the prostate, mm -hmm. which can come in different flavors, external beams to radiate the prostate ex from an external beam approach, okay. or radioactive seeds that are implanted in the prostate. Okay. There are other therapies that are less commonly used, mm -hmm. uh, like high-intensity focused ultrasound or cryotherapy. Okay. The gold standards tend to be surgery or radiation if you're going to choose a definitive approach. Okay. In more aggressive prostate cancer where there's a higher risk that microscopically some of the cancer cells could have escaped okay. their local home and threatened to spread to other areas of the body, we will co combine hormone therapy with radiation. Okay. Uh, the prostate, as we discussed, is a male reproductive organ. Right. It depends on hormones called androgens for mm -hmm. its development and its sustenance. Mm -hmm. The prostate cancer cells do as well. And so if you can deplete the body mm -hmm. of androgens or block those androgens from feeding the cancer, oh, then you can choke off one of its favorite fuel supplies. Right. And we know with high-risk localized prostate cancer from various clinical trials, mm -hmm. if you can combine that systemic therapy that will treat the cancer wherever it may be, with radiation therapy that can improve outcomes for men with high risk localized prostate cancer. Gotcha. That same systemic therapy forms the backbone of our treatment for patients who have metastatic prostate cancer, mm -hmm. which is prostate cancer that has spread to distant sites okay. that we can treat, although we can't cure it with our current tools, mm -hmm. we can effectively treat it in some men for a very long time with combinations of medical therapies. Oh wow. It sounds like there are a lot of options out there depending yes. on the type and the severity you have some things to think about yes okay so one of the other questions is a follow-up that we got from Christy was you know what do you say to your patients who may be fearful of the side effects of these treatments so it it's a an excellent question and it's a it involves a, a, a really good discussion with your mm -hmm. with your provider right uh, with the surgeon if you're considering mm -hmm. surgery, which is a radical prostatectomy, to talk about what are the risks involved with incontinence mm -hmm. or erectile dysfunction exactly. after surgery, uh, the risks of the surgery itself. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to radiation therapy, similar risks right. can apply, but the percentages can be different. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to hormone therapy or other systemic therapies, that involves discussions around those particular treatments. Okay. One of the you know, the issues with hormone therapy, it's a very effective treatment, mm -hmm. though by itself not a cure for prostate cancer, but it does so by depleting androgen hormones like testosterone, which okay. is the principal androgen hormone in your body. And there can be side effects from doing that. Mm -hmm. Fatigue, feeling weak, feeling tired, loss of sex drive, okay. uh, you know, issues with changes in your sexual approach, yeah. uh, weight gain. So That's it involves a discussion, a careful discussion with your mm -hmm. provider, and it incorporates your overall health care. And so it's where the importance of your primary care physician comes into play as well. Okay. Good to know. Really great question, Christy. We're glad you can join us here. So I know you mentioned that the risks, common risk factors are age, you know, racial identity, family history. You can't yes. really do a lot about any of those. Is there something, is there 
pe something people can do to reduce their risk of prostate cancer? So there are no proven risk reduction strategies for okay. reducing the risk for prostate cancer. A number of different things have been studied. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them may be of benefit, but we don't have definitive evidence from the studies that have been done. For okay. example, a heart-healthy diet, mm -hmm. so low in fats, uh, rich in fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. may be of benefit. Maintaining a healthy weight may be of benefit. Uh, exercise mm -hmm. may be of benefit. So okay. an overall healthy lifestyle does appear to correlate with improved outcomes. And whether okay. that's a definitive risk reduction, we still need to have more data to determine that. Okay, sounds fair. It sounds like something that we'd be working on here. So I know we do have a lot of research underway here at UT Southwestern. You know, are you aware of any clinical trials that are available for patients who have received a prostate cancer diagnosis? Yes, so we have a number of them open here, mm -hmm. and you can discuss with your healthcare provider okay. the specific trials that may be appropriate to you. Mm -hmm. uh, they cover the gamut of patients diagnosed with early localized prostate cancer mm -hmm. all the way through for patients who have metastatic resistant prostate cancer who have received a number of different treatments. Okay, good to know. I know we've only got a couple minutes left, so send those last minute questions in now. I saw we had one earlier about genetics, so I'm gonna ask that one. It is, do you suggest genetic testing if your family, if you've had that multi-generational history? Yes, yeah, so, and the guidelines for this are updated mm -hmm. constantly, and so there are various guidelines in this regard. Okay. For example, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network provides mm -hmm. guidelines for patients who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and have a family history of prostate cancer or are diagnosed okay. early. So for example, uh, current guidelines would recommend that anybody with metastatic prostate cancer be considered for genetic testing. Okay. Anybody diagnosed with prostate cancer at a young age, so mm -hmm. 55 or younger, oh, wow. or patients who have a family member diagnosed at that young age with prostate cancer or other related mm -hmm. genetic cancers, okay. such as breast or ovarian or pancreatic cancer. There okay. are additional guidelines, Interesting. and those are patients who do warrant a discussion about genetic testing to look for germline mutations that can increase the risk of those cancers okay. and could have an impact on your children. Okay, good to know. Great questions. So the last question that we've got to wrap up and let you go on to your day. Um, what do the new screening kind of guideline suggestions mean for the general public? Is it something that people should pay attention to or is it another opportunity to have a conversation with their doctor? Yes, exactly that. And that goes back to what we discussed earlier about mm -hmm. the current recommendations and guidelines from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Mm -hmm. is, and that is to have you know, an informed joint decision-making discussion with your health care provider mm -hmm. regarding screening for prostate cancer and taking into account your own personal history and your mm -hmm. family history. Okay, perfect. You know, I think that's a great question to end on. We're about out of time. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. I want to thank you for your time, Dr. You. Courtney. My pleasure. And stay tuned. So we will have this chat available here on Facebook as always, but it will also be on our YouTube channel later today. And we will share that link in the stream of comments from this chat. So thank you for joining us and have a great day.